Well, hi, it's the, uh, I think it's the 2nd of June today. I lose track. And uh, I'm taking Misty with me and we're going to Pillinglock Marina, uh, which is near Quorn, Leicestershire, uh, based on the River Saw. Um, not for any other reason other than I'm just curious uh, what kind of marina facilities it has to offer. And I've heard some good reports of the accessibility to get out on the river and it might be something that I would consider as a move in the future. So today is a bit of a recce. I'm not going to video the whole uh, drive there. I'm just going to video coming out of the marina here and then uh, I'll catch up with you when I get closer to Pilling's Lock. So uh, it's a beautiful sunny day. Enjoy and um, uh, let's see what Pilling Lock Marina has to offer. people who are currently on Mercy Marina, um, one couple in particular with an narrowboat, who actually lived in Pillinglock uh, Marina for quite a long while uh, in a wide beam and it was those that suggested I go and have a look. Um, part of the thinking is I quite fancy being on a marina that's very easy to get out straight onto a river. Now the drawback is that Mercia is very safe here because it's on the Trenton Mercy Canal and it doesn't flood. Whereas uh, Pillinglock and Red Hill Marina and Sawley Marina are all being on the rivers is more susceptible um, to the actual flooding uh, problem. And I do believe that the pontoons at uh, Pillinglock Marina are uh, what we call floating pontoons. So they actually go up and down as the water levels change on the river, which obviously influence the water levels in the marina. So it'll be a bit of an interesting one. Um, if I was to move um, to that marina, I don't think it'll be for another year. And then I quite fancy having a few months. If I moved, I'd move in the June, I think. Um, possibly the June. I might even move this next June, I don't know yet. And uh, do my do a winter there, and leading up to that winter, do as much getting out on the river saw and practicing as I can, ready for my uh, maiden voyage across to Liverpool and back with Misty. So uh, I've picked a beautiful day to come. Um, it's nice and cool in the back of my van. I've got air conditioning on, so I'm flowing air through to back where Misty is, so she's not going to get too hot. And uh, yeah, we're going to see just what it's got to offer. So a steady drive out to Mercia and uh, I'll catch up with you in a little while. I thought I'd just give you a quick update on um, today's visit to Pillings Lock Marina, which is uh, near Corn, uh, which is Loughborough, Leicester Way. Um, I went, as you know, today just to have a look. I'm not planning on leaving Mercy Marina, but I do like to have a look at what else is out there for the future. And one of the things that appealed to me when I first saw the marina um, advertised was the fact it's on the River Saw, which um, is a large, wide piece of water that isn't fast flowing or anything like that. So it's a great place for me to learn to sail freedom 
before I, uh, I make that maiden voyage out to Liverpool and back. Um, so I've been today, had a quick look round, and it's not for me. Uh, I'm not saying there's anything majorly wrong with the marina, but it's like when you go to look at a house, I suppose, and you you park your car and you get excited about going, but you park your car and you get out, and you instantly know. Um, I think it's exactly the same, but in reverse, is like when I came to look at Freedom and I stepped through the back doors, I instantly knew this was my boat. Even though I'd left a deposit on another boat, this was the boat I was going to have. And I'm a big believer you go with your gut feeling. Um, so what, what didn't appeal to me, uh, I think first and foremost was the, the, the narrow lane that you drive down to get to the marina. There's a little, very, very narrow lane. And every now and again, there's a, a cutout where you can get a car edged into the hedge bottom to let a car pass. Um, and straight away, I'm thinking, well, if there's a really bad winter and I'm living there, even if there was to put a tractor with a, a snow plow on it, where would they push the snow? Because a tractor can't push the snow to the end of the lane. It has to push it to the sides because by the time it's pushed 50 yards of snow, there's that much weight in front of a tractor, it wouldn't push it. Um, so I'm, I'm looking on the black side, obviously, because we haven't had a bad winter for a long while. Um, and then I got down the lane and turned into the marina only to find that smack in the middle your um, all your recycle bins etc are, are situated underneath a electricity pylon a huge electricity pylon now again for a lot of people that might not matter for me aesthetically it didn't look good um, and I think now I've been to look at Sawley Marina and I've now been to look at Pilling Clock the one thing I feel they have in common um, and I know they sound stupid, they're flat. To me, they're just a flat marina. Um, and I think I've been spoiled because at Mercia, you've got, I think it's like 13, something like 13, what look like separate little marinas in the whole of the whole marina, if that makes sense. Because everywhere's sectioned off with little islands and trees and shrubs and hedgerows. And it's just, you don't feel, even though it is, um, such a large marina you don't feel like you're on a large marina and when I walk down the pontoon it feels homely and within nature and I went to walk down one of the pontoons and the first thing I noticed there's no security on the pontoon so if you was a visitor for the day there's nothing to stop you walking down um, by the backs of people's boats whereas at least at Mercia you need to be a mora to have a keypad that gets you in um, which is enough to deter the, what I call the general visitors to the Broadwalk area. Um, the other thing, and again it sounds snobbish, and, it, and it's just being honest, and I'm not trying to degrade Pillingslock, and I'm not honestly trying to degrade Sawley, because there's a lot of people who live there who are very, very happy. And I spoke to a chap at Pillinglock, and he'd been there 14 years on his narrow boat. And I asked him, I said, and how do you find it? He said, I love it, absolutely love it. He says, it's a great community. And I think, you know, it's what, it's what you're happy with is all that matters. So if the people who are living and mooring it, Pillings Lock think they can, they can disregard the pylon, that's fine. You know, no disrespect to them. If they're happy, then that's, that's all that matters. And I think the, the thing I noticed between Sawley and Pillings Lock is that there seemed to be a lot of stuff on the boats. And I'm used to being in a marina now where it's a little bit tighter on that kind of thing. You know, you haven't got a rusty old bike on the top of somebody's narrow boat or 18 sacks of coal on the top of somebody's wide beam. It's all kept neat and tidy. And I felt that Pillings Lock and Sawley both looked tired. You know, um, they both looked tired. The whole setup looked tired. Uh, as if it needed some money pumping in. And I know we've just come through a bad year and uh, maybe things will look better in the future. So I'm not rolling them out forever, but I am saying that at the moment, I would score both Sawley and um, Pillings Lock Marinas. I think I would score them six, six and a half out of 10. When I look at Mercia, 
I would score Mercier nine, nine and a half. There's a few little bits that niggle, but I am talking little, you know. It's not enough for me to want to take the ropes off the pontoon and sail away at the moment. Uh, and even when I do retire, I do think I'll end up keeping my mooring, go off to do me maiden voyage to Liverpool and back. And then when I go out in future, I might go out for a month, I might go out for two months, I might only go out for a week, but at least I can come back to my mooring so I know I've got somewhere permanent, for want of a better word. So I just thought I'd share that with you. And if there's anybody who watches this channel who lives it sorely, please, I'm not trying to offend anybody. It's just my personal opinion. Um, I know that not, not everybody likes Mercia and there's a few people who've been here for a few years have left because they feel it's becoming too commercialised. I'm fortunate, I think, that the pontoon that I'm on um, is far enough away from that that you don't feel and you don't see it and therefore it's not affecting me on a day-to-day -day basis. If anything changes in the future, I'll tell you. But for now, I ain't going nowhere. Just thought I'd tell you. Hi, well, I've got to share this with you. I'm very excited. I've had a parcel. And I think I know what's in it. Although I don't know who it's from, but I think I know what's in it. And uh, I'm very excited. I've not had a parcel since I've been on board. So uh, I'm going to open it. And let's see if I'm right in what I think it is. And I'll see if I can find out who it's from. Came the other day and uh, I went to the office to get me the laundry topped up today. And uh, what a surprise. So, I'm like a kid at Christmas. Especially if it's what I think it is. Got a card. Somebody must know it's my birthday in two weeks' time. Hint, hint, 19th of June. Not that I'm mentioning it, right? Right, what we got? Ah, oh. well, thank you. Just a little something to say thank you for your fantastic vlogs and for allowing us to share in your boat life journey. We have binge watched every vlog and love your relaxed style in informative presentations. Misty is a beautiful girl and we have sent her a present too. Keep the vlogs coming, especially Cider of the Week. Here are some for you to try and review. Lots of love to you both, Ian and Megan Harris, Sheffield. Ah, oh. ah, oh, they're chuffed. <laughs> Thank you, Ian and Megan. Thank you. Right, Misty, you've got a present. <laughs> Yeah, well, that won't last very long. It might be a jumbo for a normal dog. Misty, look. Yeah, what is it? Look, get up here. Come here, Grinch. Put your head up here so they can see you on camera. Ooh, look at that. <gasps> look what they sent you. Yes. It's a shame you're on a diet. In a bit. I might cut a bit off. It's exactly what I thought it was going to be. We have got the looks of it. <laughs> it's Brothers Strawberry and Cream English Cider. Misty, leave that alone, you're not having it yet. Oh, look here. Oh, that's going to taste like cider then. Henry Weston's medium dry British vintage cider. Stella Artois cider Belgium recipe. So that's cider of the week sorted for the next three weeks. Misty, you're not having it yet. Sit. 
Just because it's your present, don't mean you've got to eat it straight away. Ah, oh, thank you, Ian and Megan. How lovely is that? I know I did say if you wanted me to review a cider, send me some. <laughs> I was only joking. I was only joking. But I really appreciate that. So, oh well, the decision I've got to make now is which one are we going to pop in the icebox? Because I'm actually videoing Cider of the Week tonight. But it's Monday and I have to do all my editing tomorrow, Tuesday. So, uh, if it's all right with you two, I think strawberry and cream is what I'm going to review this week. And I'm just going to try and do a bit of a re um, research as to what it costs. I do like to put the cost in the log and I, I can't ask you to tell me, send me the cost what you've paid because it's a gift. But thank you very much and uh, I'm looking forward to reviewing that. I am, I'm dead chuffed. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Oh. Catch up with you in a bit. The other day I was out on the marina with Misty and I got into a conversation with a fellow Maura who also watches the channel and she says I'm loving Cider of the Week which I thought was nice because it's obviously something that's new and then she says have you stopped cooking and you know I've only just realised it's quite a while since I've done anything in the way of cooking so I'm about to do my tea so I'm still in my scruffs but uh, I've raided the fridge, I found a few items in the fridge and I'm going to rustle up a quick and easy snack that maybe you'd want to give a try in the future and uh, it's nice and easy so sit back and uh, let me know what you think afterwards. Okay, now this hasn't come out of the fridge, um, it's something I'm quite partial to. It's actually called Giraffe Bloomer and I have been assured that no giraffes have been hurt in the making of this bread. So what we're going to do, I'm not going to waste any because I will eat this after, we're going to cut off some doorsteps. If you're going to have some bread, you may as well know you've had some. So we're going to have two, good size, Nice and thick doorsteps. And that's the first stage sorted. How easy was that? Now I found a little drop of olive oil, not a lot. We don't need a lot. So what you're gonna do is just drizzle the bread with some olive oil. And then we're gonna set it aside to soak, turn over. Do it to the side, turn over, the other side. Now if you don't like olive oil, there's no reason why you can't use a little bit of butter just to uh, soak into the bread before we go any further with it. Now let's have a look what I found in the fridge. Right, bit of a mixed bag. We've got some chestnut mushrooms. We have a pack of fresh thyme, a packet of sage. Now I did use some of this last night in some burgers that I made. I found some French mustard. I found a little bit of garlic. I've also found what we've got, four bit tired looking spring onions, but I'm gonna put these to use because I don't need to waste them. And some uh, double cream that I bought to have with some strawberries which I might do later. So what are we having? Let's have a go and see what we can make. We're going to do garlic mushrooms in cream sauce um, on toast. How easy is that? And the first thing I want to do is just make use of these spring onions more often than not, when they get to a point where you won't want them in a salad, most people just throw them away. And uh, it's a shame because there's still lots of goodness left in them. So we're just going to trim them down. We don't need loads, but these are just destined for the bin if we don't use them in this dish. 
and uh, I'm a big believer in using what you've got. As you'll have seen before, it's amazing what meals you can make out of bits and pieces you've got kicking around in the fridge. Okay, they're trimmed off. Get rid of the rubbish. I'll sort the garlic. Now, again, you don't have to put garlic in. I just think it gives it that bit of a kick. And uh, you can leave it out. It's really down to personal preference. Now, I'm going to show you a little a little top tip as well with garlic in a minute. Let's get his skin off on it. I'm going to use two cloves and uh, I'm not at work for the next three days, so uh, well, <laughs> other than annoying my neighbours if I talk to them, um, it doesn't matter if I smell garlic, and it is good for you, medicinally good for you. Let me just get rid of the uh, trimmings and then I'll show you a top tip. Right, most people. Nowadays we'll have a plastic board, but especially if you've got a wooden chopping block that you're going to use, just put a sprinkle of salt. Not a lot, you don't need loads, just a bit. And then when you crush your garlic down, all the juices go into the salt and not into your board. And all we're going to do is just finally chop these down and then set them aside. We'll be using these a little bit later in the dish, not straight away. And then I just want to discuss with you the most popular mistake that people make when working with mushrooms. And I dare bet when I tell you, you'll go, yes, I do that. Because we all do, unless we know we're different. Okay. And that salt is taking up all the juice the garlic can now be set aside. Now, as I say, these are chestnut mushrooms. These are a little bit more um, nutty flavour than your normal white mushrooms you buy, your button mushrooms. Now, the biggest mistake every man and his dog make is they get them from the supermarket and they've got a little bit of, of the compost still on them and the first thing they'll do is rush to the tap with a sieve, colander, put the mushrooms in and wash them. Really, really can't stress enough, you must not wash your mushrooms. These guys contain one heck of a lot of water. And the problem you've got is when you start to cook, they're going to release that water. And there's several stages throughout the cooking where you can help to prevent this. But if you wash these, these are like sponge. They're going to soak up all that water that you're thinking you're doing good with just to wash off a little bit of the um, compost. So just get a damp, and it only just needs to be damp, a bit of kitchen roll, give them a wipe, don't wash them, and uh, the results will be you'll get a nice um, texture on your mushroom whereas if you do wash them what you end up with is a slimy mushroom so i'm just going to give these a wipe and then i'll come back to you and show you how we prepare them Right, now these have all been wiped. Now the other reason people say they wash them under the tap is to wash off bacteria. But I'm sorry to say, using cold water is gonna have no effect to any bacteria. And the fact you're gonna cook these at a high temperature, if there is any bugs, and I don't mean insect type bugs, I mean bacterial bugs, you will have cooked them out as you would when you're cooking raw meats. So 
as I say, don't use that as an excuse to put your mushrooms under the tap. Now, another mistake when you're making mushrooms on toast, that a lot of people make, is, and you've seen me do this when I'm using mushrooms in a, a curry or a casserole, is they get the mushroom, let me just show you if it makes sense then. We'll get the mushroom, as you see them on telly, or the shishan telly. And what they're doing, they're cutting wafer thin. And the problem is then, it's just going to ooze water into the cook that you're doing. Now if you're making a stew or a casserole, that ain't so bad. But we don't want slimy mushrooms on toast. So, whatever you do, don't be tempted to cut them like that. And don't be frightened to cut them quite, yeah, we're going to do them, we're going to do them in halves. It's a man's meal. Now you can cut them into quarters if you like, but there's a reason I choose to do them in halves. And I'll show you that in a second when we come to cook. These are a much nicer tasting mushroom, I believe, than the white buttons. Um, and they're only a few pennies more. And if you're going to use them in a dish like this, then do spend that extra little bit. Uh, this does look a lot, but don't forget mushrooms do cook down a bit. And uh, I have a big appetite. And there we go. Mushrooms are done. All we've got to do now is I'm going to set that aside a minute. We're just going to pull off Pull off a little bit of the um, the thyme. You don't need loads, but it adds to the dish. Try not to put the stalks in. We don't want the stalks. No matter if it's a very fine stuff off the ends, but you know you get some of these uh, supermarket thymes are quite um, woody. And you don't want to be eating it and then thinking, crikey, that's like not eating a matchstick. The very fine tips, as I say, aren't a problem. So just a little bit more. It smells gorgeous, this does. Can't beat fresh thyme. That's all we need. We don't need any more than that. And that can go back in the fridge. And I'm sure I'll find another dish that I can use that in. And if not, you can always dry it and uh, again put it into casseroles and things and it's dry so then just it's more for taste than anything you know to add to the flavour you don't need a mountain of it and it doesn't need to be too carefully chopped now that can go on the plate next to the garlic I don't know if you can hear Misty snoring in the background. And again, with the basil, uh, sorry, the sage. That's what I'm thinking about basil for. With the sage, three or four leaves, that's all you need. And again, just fold them together. Don't need to wash it for the same reason you don't want to be washing your mushrooms. Put them together. Nice and fine. If you don't want to do it with a knife, then you can use a one of these little electric choppers you know, that you can get, kitchen aids or whatever they're called. With your um, sage, again, try and get this a little bit smaller because it's quite a coarse herb and you don't really want to be chewing. And a chunk of it again just put that on there with the uh, garlic while we're doing that we're just going to uh, finely chop these spring onions and remember if you watch the uh, christmas 
pre-Christmas um, video, always make sure your knives are sharp because the most dangerous knife in a kitchen is a blunt knife. The second most dangerous knife is the wrong knife. So uh, always try to make sure if you're going to slice using a like this using a chopping knife, you're not doing it with a, a steak knife. I'll do for that. Again, I'll just add a little bit of something into the dish. Now all these are going to go in part way through the cook, so it doesn't matter if they get mixed up on the plate. And I'm going to take you across to the uh, stove and we're going to start these uh, mushrooms. Now, if you've got a large pan, the larger the pan the better. And uh, your second top tip, when you come to cooking mushrooms, I've already told you they're full of water. So don't compact them into a saucepan because all that does, it just generates so much wet. The steam that's coming off the, the actual mushrooms as they're drying out is going to just get amongst all what's packed on top of each other and it just creates an ongoing problem. Now this, and now put into this pan that's warming up. Not a crazy amount, but that is sea salt. We're now just waiting for this pan to get nice and hot. I've took the portal glass out, so it's just blowing the flames a little bit. And yeah. Uh, all you need to do is just place your mushrooms cut side down and as you can see using a large pan I'm going to have a lot of space between them and the salt will actually draw the water out of the mushrooms and uh, eventually it'll just evaporate in the steam that's coming off the pan. I can hear them now already starting to release the water, it's starting to hiss. And this is really is a, a simple, easy, quick snack. Tastes fantastic and something you can do once you've moored up. Right. Now the one thing with these is don't mess with them. Put them on, check them every now and again, but don't don't mess around with them. Just leave them to do their own thing. So I'm going to take my smoke alarm down because in a bit I'm going to start using a bit of oil and I don't want it to set my, my smoke alarm off. And I'll come back to you when these have had an extra few more minutes to cook. Right, these have had maybe two or three minutes and I can see steam coming off them and they are cooking away underneath. So once I've got a chance to get rid of some of the, the damp that's inside the mushrooms, we're going to give them a sprinkle of olive oil. And again, this is going to help relieve the steam that's in there. Keeping the cut side down for now. At this point we can put the garlic in and the spring onion. And we've got more oil. Yeah, one of the, the biggest issues in cooking mushrooms is people try to cook them too gentle. And the problem with that is again it, it slowly releases out the water and you need the heat to get rid of it. You can see now steam coming off the top of here and uh, we're just going to cook the garlic in give it a few minutes eventually we'll turn the mushrooms over but for now the fine as they are and we'll just give them a minute and i'll come back to you this is really starting to smell lovely now i'm just going to turn the heat down so we don't burn the garlic and we're going to add what gives it its real kick is about 300 grams of butter. Let that get 
mash it amongst it and then we can uh, now we can turn the mushrooms we've released a lot of the flavour and the water's gone and now we're just going to let them gently cook and turn them over and what you're going to have is a, a nice texture in your mushroom you're not going to have something that's just taste all slimy if that makes sense and uh, as I say these are a beautiful tasting mushroom in the first place so what you don't want is to be eating something that just tastes like wet rubber okay I'll give them a few minutes and I know all the TV chefs when they're doing this will go this smells absolutely fantastic well this smells absolutely fantastic and it does really once you've done your prep it is only a case of minutes of preparation um, and then a few minutes to cook them through we're going to do the toast in a, in a frying pan that's why we've put the oil on the toast and we're going to put that into a dry hot pan and color it both sides and whilst that's happening what's going to happen with the mushrooms is they're going to soak in a, a cream and mustard sauce which is going to again give them that little bit of an extra kick but as you can see don't these look absolutely flipping gorgeous and they smell oh, they smell nice okay so we're now going to add And cream sorry to go out to shop needs must Put in the, the herbs. And again, always remember the golden rule when you're cooking. Don't have any golden rules. Play with it. Do what, what you feel you want to do with it. You know, don't be led by a recipe, but don't be dictated to by a recipe. Because it's all about experimentation. Oh, crikey. Let's turn that down a bit. Now, secret ingredient. Well, it's not a secret, because I've already told you I've got it. For me, teaspoon. Of French mustard. That's going to give it that extra bit of something. Now it does smell nice. It really is coming together. Now, obviously, mushrooms in for everybody. I understand that this isn't a dish for you, but do give it a go. You will not be disappointed. Oh man, I'm not just saying this, but French mustard completely transforms the dish. And yes, you can use English mustard. You can, if you want, put a small amount of marmite in you could use Liam Perrins, you can use Worcester sauce. Experiment. It's what's, you know, what is nice for you, might not be nice for somebody else. So you've got to play with it. And as I say, the golden rule is don't set yourself golden rules because you'll just cook the same thing time after time and that isn't what it's about. So I'm going to set these aside now on a low light just to 
gently cook through. And let that sauce do what it needs to do, which will reduce down. And somewhere I should have, is that going to be big enough? Yeah. Second stick frying pan, which we're now going to get nice and hot. And then we're going to put the uh, the two thick chunks of bread in there. And this is a real, I'll call it, and I'm not being sexist, this is a proper filling meal. It's a man's meal, even though it's cost very, very little. And it's using up things you've got in your fridge. As I said, you can use ordinary button mushrooms. You don't have to have um, chestnut mushrooms. And you can use wild mushrooms as long as you know what you're picking. Um, I'd imagine this, if it was done with a blue stalk mushroom, would be absolutely fantastic. You could use Chinese mushrooms. It really doesn't matter. Um, it is very forgiving. And I like dishes which are exactly that, very forgiving. So we're just going to place that in there. Get rid of the plate. And I'll keep going out a shot. But I'm doing this live. And it is my, it is my tea. So <laughs> I've got to make sure it's somewhat like right. I keep saying it, it tastes lovely, absolutely lovely. Don't be put off if your sauce looks like it's separated out, it does not matter. It's just the reaction of the cream and the butter. You know, it's not about how it physically looks at this point. What matters is it tastes, and does it taste nice? Well, this pan's getting hot now, so we should get some colour on these in a bit. This is one of the reasons I've took the, um, the smoke alarm down because the last thing I want is that going off in the middle of a film. I'll come back to you in a minute when I've got a bit of colour on the toast and then we'll plate it up. Right, let's turn these over. That'll do. I'll just take you across to the table and I'll just plate it up for you. Okay, so all that sauce now is soaking into the bread. As I say, you can use, you don't have to use a giraffe bloomer like I have. You can use tiger bread. You could use um, any, just a normal thick sliced bread and to make your toast. And the idea is that the toast now is going to soak up all the juices that's coming out of these mushrooms. And uh, I've not aimed for presentation because I'm trying to cook and film at the same time. And uh, this is my tea. So I've shown you how to do it. Have a go. And if you tell me you don't like it, I'll be very, very surprised. Remember to play with different ingredients. Don't be frightened to change different mustards, different sauces. And uh, let me know how you get on. But for now, clear off, I'm having my tea. Side of the week. Oh. Oh, good evening, and welcome to this week's side of the week. And a big thank you to Ian and Megan, Ian and Megan Harris from Sheffield, for providing us, providing me this week's and the next three weeks next two weeks cider of the week they are so well i just can't get over it they've sent us a bottle of brothers strawberries and cream english cider now this is 330 mil 
I meant to look up the price. Uh, I did it this afternoon, to be fair, and I forgot to bring it on the back of the boat with me. Um, but when I do the log, I'll write the price at the side of it because I like to see, you know, what it costs. Now this is only, a, and I'm not being disrespectful, <laughs> this is only 330 mil. So I think it's one of the more expensive ciders if you're looking at uh, price per volume. Um, so we'll uh, let's look at that. Now looking on the bottle, it actually doesn't tell me anything. Whereas people like Bulmers describe the cider. This is actually um, manufactured in Shepton Mallet, which I know very, very well. I used to have an auntie that lived down there. And I can remember going to a farm down there and buying um, proper cheddar cheese. And by God, you can tell the difference between that and what you buy in a supermarket. So let's hope that Brother Cider UK, based in um, Shepton Mallet, Somerset, have made a cracking cider. And there's only one way to find out. Let's open it. So, I can smell it without even smelling it, if that makes sense. Ooh. <laughs> oh, that smells lovely. See, I'm partial to a sweet cider. So anything that's a red cider, that's berry type, will uh, appeal. I'm going to tip the old bottle in, to heck with it. Right, Ian and Megan, let's see how good it is. Well, it's a 4% uh, volume. And it tastes like kids pop. <laughs> It really does. It tastes like kids pop. Oh, I bloody like this. That ticks all the boxes for me. It's dead refreshing. It's light. It's sweet. It's got plenty of fizz. And it tastes... Well, it doesn't taste like cider. Honestly, it doesn't. It just tastes like red kids pop. Now that, that is a side that I could actually enjoy sitting on the back of the boat, not necessarily having anything to eat, you know, when you just want to sit out and relax. That is a nice, really nice cider. So I found out when I was doing my research this afternoon, although I've forgotten the price, but I will, as I say, I'll put it in the, in the vlog. Um, that B&M Bargains, uh, my local B&M Bargains sells it, not all B&M &M, B &M Bargains sell alcohol. Um, but this is available from mine and I'm sure you must be able to get it in supermarkets. I've never seen it before, um, but I'm sure if you were to, if you to Google Brothers Strawberries and Cream Cider, who stocks it near me, I'm sure you'll find it. And I'll tell you something, go and buy a bottle. Give it a try. Tell me you don't bloody like it because it's gorgeous. <laughs> it is. Oh. Could you send me a pack of four next time? <laughs> Cheers. Catch you next week.